This is Genatsa Tayer, a toast to Armenia with Jano Kabinjian. A comprehensive look at the Armenian culture only on the Ignotainment Media Network. It's May 15th, my friends. Glad to have you on, Chris. We're going to do a great show today. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Hey, last week, wasn't that uh, terrific interviewing uh, Vic Martirosian? Man, he is a very interesting guy. Young guy, boxing, taking care of family. I, I mean, I felt like... Uh, Felt like, uh, you know, what a great guy. Yep, he's humble a, guy. I think he's going to be a big star in the boxing world. Uh, you you remember uh, where he's going to be? Uh, where his matches? Yep, it's going to be at the Florentine Gardens in Hollywood on May thirtieth. May thirtieth, yep. my friends, be out there. If you're in the neighborhood, check him out. And if you're in the L.A. area, you got to see him. He's one of ours, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure he'll make us very happy. Oh yeah. Absolutely. In uh, world news, this is something that I wanted to uh, catch up on here. This is beautiful because it's like a uh, Armenia's big brother now. China is every day getting closer with Armenia. Uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of China Chen Gopin said, We have a reliable partner in the face of Armenia. The Armenian-Chinese friendship is at the highest level it's ever been. Wow, that's a big I, deal. That is a big deal because you know what? China is a a big man on campus, you might say. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, and uh, you know what this means also? This means more stability in economics and having China backing you up. That's big time. It is a big deal. Even down to tourism, Chinese, uh, the China has this one uh, tourist magazine, and they dedicated it all to the Armenian uh Tourism. Wow, that they is, they that want people. Yeah, I mean that 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 would that would be great for our finances if we if we could get uh, more tourism in Armenia. I mean, face it, we don't have the oils or the ports like I said at one time. So this would be great for us. Yeah, and exposure all throughout Asia too, which is great. excellent. Yep. Yeah, you're you're so right. In sports, in sports, my friends, FC Ararat. You guys know Ararat, famous team. Uh, They celebrated their May 10th. They celebrated their 80th year as a team since 1935. And I know, Chris, uh, you're not familiar with Ararat, but Ararat, man, there was a time when these guys could have possibly taken on the world. They were that strong. Yeah, they were were unbelievable. I got to tell you guys a quick story. When I was in Lebanon, I, I grew up in Lebanon as a little kid. I got to see Ararat come to Lebanon to play against this Arab team. And somehow the fix was in. Chris, the (laughs) fix was in that day because Russia's told Armenia they cannot win this game. We got this. All the Armenians got the news, but we just didn't want to believe it, that Armenia (laughs) had to lose. Ararat had to lose this game. Well, our boys came out on the field. It was about 50,000. I'm telling you, as a little kid, I seen the stadium completely packed, and I seen our boys running out on the field all dressed in white. They were really cool looking. I I was like, wow, this is our uh, – and sure enough, it was 0-0, and then one of our guys took a shot at the goal, and uh, he hit the uh. crossbar, and they <laughs> took him out of the game. <laughs> they pulled him out of the game, and – my dad said they're they're fixing this. We can't win this game. We end up losing this game one to zero against wow. this Arab team in Lebanon. We get in the car. We're leaving. I look in the back, and the stadium's on fire. Oh no yeah. way! Oh yeah, they uh, they. Uh, I think they burnt down the stadium that day. <laughs> the Armenians did. Well, that'll handle that. Uh, we won't have no fixing with our games hey. anymore. But in any case, it that's was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, that's the way they did it over there, and um, we're celebrating their 80th birthday no. as a team. That is incredible. I don't even know if they're good anymore or whatever, but that used to be uh, when you heard Ararat, man. I mean, uh, that was Armenia's best team. As for our national team, uh, not so good. Uh, the they're still number 77. Thank God they didn't slip. Uh, they still held rank the number 77. So that's pretty good news, I guess. Uh, we didn't slide at all. Better than 78. Uh, closer. 
closer to home in Armenia. It seems about the genocide thing again. It seems Israel isn't ready to yet say thank God April twenty fourth is uh, coming gone. Oh, well, that's interesting. It is because you know what the, these these countries that are always uh, against the April twenty fourth and don't want to think about it just let it go. But the Knesset speaker, which is like the acting president, okay. is Yuli Edelstein. He called the government of Israel to recognize the 1915 genocide. Oh, wow. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's a really a big deal of the Armenian people by the Ottoman Turks at a special debate on the subject in Parliament on Tuesday. He brought this up on Tuesday. Now, what's more special about this is that Edelstein becomes the acting president when the president is abroad. Oh, that's... that's so when Reuven Rivlin was in Germany at this time... Well, he comes out as the president and says this, that we should do something about this and uh, recognize the Armenian genocide. That's a very big deal. It's a very big deal because, look here, if Israel if Israel recognizes the Armenian genocide, this opens the floodgates here. Be England will soon uh, recognize, not that I really, England follows the suit of United States, sure. whatever United States does, and United States will say, you know what, if Israel's okay with it, let's roll with it as well. Absolutely. So that's really, really big time. Hey, so also in the uh, the world of arts, okay, so this is straight from the L.A. newspaper, the L.A. Times. L.A. Times. L.A. Times, yeah. And so I know we have a lot of uh, L.A. listeners, so maybe you saw this. But uh, so Armenia earlier this week was actually awarded the Venice Biennale's Golden Lion, which is an award for the you know the best national pavilion, which is called Armenity. Wow! And wow. Uh, it uh, addresses the Armenian diaspora, and uh, it's you know a, a big deal. And the Armenian Philharmonic Orchestra it made an appearance at the the uh, the Walt Disney Hall in. Uh, L.A. for uh, a, a show of remembrance. Wow. Which is, wow. A, you know, a really, really big deal, you know, the Armen uh, to bring in the National Philharmonic Orchestra. And, and they were at Walt Disney? At Walt, yeah, in L.A. at the, the Hollywood, you know, where they have the Grammys and the Oscars right, and all that. Yeah, right, right, It's a big deal. Well, I'm glad yeah. they're not letting anything slip, man. This is beautiful. Well, and, it, you know, I... I think it's highlighting, you know, the glory of, of the arts from Armenia here in the States, which, you know, it needs to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, you know what? The, we just mentioned Israel. It's hitting at home base, too. I mean, this is all over the world. They're not letting this one slip by. That's good. That's good. That's what I got on this one, my friends. Uh, hey, did you see the T-shirts that we got? Oh, they're great, aren't they? I'm, Those I, Armenian T-shirts? Everybody's going to be very excited about them. We'll have them on uh, the website and on all of our social media. You'll be able to see them. I, that, it's going to be great, guys. Uh, we got the T-shirts in, and all I'm asking for, this can't be that difficult, is send us an email or put a review or a, a something on the iTunes podcast show. Yep. Saying how good we are, basically. I mean, yeah. we're doing something here that's, uh, and we're not charging anything for these shirts. We're giving them out to our special guests that we have every week. Uh, and we're also go going to be giving them out to our fans out there as well. But we got to get these shirts out to you guys. And what better than to, to celebrate with uh, giving out these shirts to everybody? Yeah, it's absolutely. a cool shirt, oh, though. I'm, I'm wearing mine right now. And, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And on that too, we got book markers from uh, Roger on 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 that uh, east book, of Byzantium. Yeah, very cool. And we'll throw that in as well, man. Yeah. I mean, Roger was really excited about these book markers, and he sent them uh, to me. And uh, I'd love to get them out to you guys as well. Yeah, everyone on our site seemed to be really interested in his book. So. Oh my God, are you are you kidding? We had so much good responses on. On his books. Absolutely. Uh, folks, go to Roger Capellian's site, uh, east of uh, Byzantium, yep. and order yourself one of these books. If you can't order the $150 one, order the $30 one. That's just as good, man. Absolutely. I'm telling you right now, you guys will definitely enjoy it. And um, I tell you what, we got a guest. Yeah. We got very, a guest. Very neat guest. Well, our big guest for today, we got a special guest here. He, he, he's a big-time chess player. He became 
an international master at the age of 16 in 2001. On his birthday, on his 20th birthday, November 2003, he earned the title of Grand Master. Wow. Grand Master. I mean, Chris, that even sounds like a big, uh, that, that's, that sounds like a kung fu master. I'm, I'm so. scared to even know what that is. Yeah, that's big time. He won an open tournament, a world open tournament in Philadelphia on three separate occasions. Wow. 2004, 2007, and, oh, I forgot, 2002 also. <laughs> and uh, in 2007, he was featured on MTV True Life documentary series in episode title, I'm a Genius. Yeah. Pretty proper for him, right? Yeah, that uh, that explains it. As of May 2014, he was the fifth highest rated player in the USA with a FIDE rating of 2,643 Varujan Akobian, it is great to have you on our show, my brother. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. So what's been going on with you? Uh, well, I had two major tournaments. I was in St. Louis in the, in the beginning of May for the U.S. Championship, U.S. Chess Championship. So that was one of my major events of the year. So I played in it. It was a 12-player uh, uh, round-robin tournament. Round-robin is where you play everyone. So I faced uh, the top players, and um, I had a you know pretty decent showing. I finished fifth. Uh, that but, was uh, with the world I, players, right? No, this was the U.S. Championship. U.S. Championship, US all championship, right. Yeah, and uh, so I was a pretty you know decent result. I think I could have done probably a little bit better. But uh, and after that, right after that, I actually flew to Armenia very next day to participate in a World Team Championship, and uh, representing the U.S. team. And uh, we had a good performance. We tied for fourth place in that tournament. That's great. And how did Armenia do? Armenia was third. Third. Uh -huh. All right. Third. That's not bad. That's not yeah. bad. Our boys in uh, Armenia did all right there as well. Now, you yes. rank 2,632 right now, right? Yes. What does, what, does, what does that mean, actually? Uh, we're kind of idiots about that. Tell us. Yeah. I know it's about winning and so forth, but... What type of wins do your points go up and all that? Yeah, it's basically a rating. Uh, every every professional player, even some amateur players, they have a, a FIDE rating. FIDE is the international organization for chess, like FIFA is for soccer, for example. Right. FIDE is, uh, if you abbreviate it, it's called Federation International de Echecs. It was uh, established, I think, in uh, France uh, about 100 years ago. So, uh, and we have ranking, and uh, uh, if you do well, let's say if I place someone with about the same rating, rating as me, I would win, I would gain five points. If I lose, it goes negative five points. So, if you make a draw, it probably would stay the same. So, to get your rating up, you have to perform well and try to win as many games as you can. If you don't perform well, your rating goes down. Wow, wow. That's incredible. Yeah, how uh, how how do you, uh, like you played this in Armenia too, right? When you were a little yes, kid, yeah, yeah. When and, I yeah, mm -hmm. and I ha I got a friend uh, on Facebook who's a a big fan of our uh, Toast Armenia. He he asked me a question when I told him that you were going to be on our show. He said, "Can you please ask him what makes the schools of Armenia?" have uh, chess it's a it's a mandatory class to have chess what what's your thoughts on that yeah it's uh, well uh, there's a couple of very important factors first of all uh, we have great traditions in armenia for chess we had a former world champion tigran petrosian the only armenian champion who won the title in 1963 and um it's a small country and chess is extremely popular I think because of Petrosian and all the young kids recently I think two three years ago it was introduced as a curriculum in the regular schools uh, for the uh, for the lower grades kids so it's like a subject so and uh, they are taught in the schools and eventually they find the really really talented players and they try to give them more training and see if they can become grandmasters or even the top players in the world. Yeah, that's that, that's extremely interesting. I was actually was going to ask, you know, adding on to that, have you heard any discussion ever of any schools in the U.S., you know, starting to offer it as a, a class or, you know, anything, you know, I know a lot of schools offer it as an extracurricular, as a club, but, I mean, actually as a part of your schooling, you know, to learn chess. 
Yeah, I don't know as a regular subject. I haven't heard anything like that. Uh, it probably would be a great idea if it's introduced. But uh, I know uh, a lot of the schools uh, all over the, uh, the country, they have the after school programs. So after the school, the kids, they have a chess club and they have a teacher who teaches them. Sometimes they even have really early in the morning. They have like a 45-minute class before they start their classes. So as far as it's like a subject, I haven't heard anything, but uh, maybe in the future. A couple of other countries are actually adopting that, what Armenia did, and they're starting to introduce. And uh, there were a lot of researches made that, you know, it's just a lot of positive things can happen if the children learn to play chess, not necessarily to become professional players, but just to have the ability to think and make sure they're not rushing before they're making decisions. Sure. Now, now I have a question regarding that as well. Does your playing chess does it have any dialogue to how you're thinking outside as well? I mean, the, the comparison on uh, playing chess to your everyday living. Do you guys uh, break down situations using the chessboard? Is what I'm saying. A, a lot of your uh, plays and so forth come. Uh, to where uh, you're like thinking ahead and so forth on play. I, I'm just wondering. Yeah, it does. It does sometimes on a daily basis. Usually, most players, of course, there are sometimes different people, but uh, we try to uh, not to make like a, you know snap decisions. Try to you know like we do in chess. When you see a good move, you don't just try to make it right away. You try to go a little bit deeper, see if at the end of a variation, long variation, if there is you know maybe some flaws or anything. So sometimes, yeah. Uh, we 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 like to think before we make decisions. Sometimes it's uh, you know most of the time it's good, but sometimes you're you know a bit uh, you know thinking too much. Thinking so too much about too, it. Yeah. yeah, that happens you know, to it, us too. You know, yeah. you know, so you could miss some nice opportunities if you're just thinking too much. So, but overall, I think it's it's uh, you know it's good. Uh, it's helpful in life. Well, Varujan, let me ask you this too. A big part of the, you're you're part of the uh, U.S. team, right? Yes, I've been a part of the U.S. Olympic team since 2006. Uh, let me ask you this. The Eastern European teams, such as Armenia, all the, all, all the Eastern teams that uh, you guys play against, and the Asian teams, is there a different style of play that they have that the West uh, has a different play to, or, or do you guys play the same? I mean, is it like... Uh, um. Is the game uh, is the game a little different over there than it is over here? Are they do they take more chances over there? Are they more conservative play? They'll wait for you to make a mistake? How does it work? Um, to be honest, at a very high level, it's not like um, if you play a team from China, they're gonna be super aggressive. It's they all try to play properly. You know, some players. You know, there are a couple of players in the top that they like to be a little bit more aggressive. But some players are just very calm. Like the number one player in the world right now is Magnus Carlsen. And uh, he's the big superstar and uh, by far the best player in the past couple of years. But he's, if you look at his games, he's not really trying to go after his opponent just to crush them. Just slowly grinding down. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the games last five, six hours and eventually, but he, you know, usually brings the point home. So uh, it's everybody trying to be a little bit cautious. They're not trying to just, you know, the game starts trying to sacrifice and go for a win because at a very high level, most likely this is going to backfire and they will probably lose the game. Uh, now, what about the Armenian team? What do you see from the Armenian national team? Armenian team, it's more, you know, positional play. You know, you know, Petrosian, the, the mentioned the world, former world champion, he was a very, very one of the best positional players. Positional play is just when you try to slowly maneuver your pieces, try to improve the squares, and slowly, slowly increasing the pressure. So a lot of the guys, actually, I know very well, I train with them, so they, they have that. They're positionally, they're very strong. And, of course, they're very good in other areas of the game. But in particular, I would emphasize that position with the Armenian team is fantastic. So so they wait. They actually just slowly grind it away to yeah. have you make a mistake or, or push you against yes. the wall. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Absolutely. Uh, the Armenian players out there right now, including you, how close are they? Is Is there any individual player out there right now ready to come forth as uh, taking the number one spot again in the world? Well, uh, the, the biggest, uh, you know, yes, the biggest uh, star Armenian is, of course, Levon Aronian, and uh, he 
Uh, he played a couple of tournaments in St. Louis on, I think, two different, two or three different occasions. He played. Uh, he usually comes once a year, and uh, he was the number two in the world for a very long time. So maybe about three, four years, he was stable number two. He was trying to make a push. He came close to become number one, but he couldn't surpass Magnus Carlsen. Uh, so Carlsen has been basically dominating force in the past five years in chess. So then Aronian had an unfortunate year last year, so he lost um, you know, a lot of rating points, the FIDE, FID points that we talk about. It. So he slipped to about a tenth in the world, but last two tournaments are, he's doing better, so he's right now eight, and he's trying to make a comeback and be kind of where he belonged for many years. So I think the biggest chance to be number one is, of course, Aronian. And um, but you know the competition is tough. They're younger than him, and uh, the new generation is just younger, and they're you know they're maybe memory a little bit better, energy level. So all these factors uh, are very important in chess. You know, one one time we were together, and I asked you that question. I, I asked you about. Uh, I would have thought getting older, you become much more. Uh, I guess uh, more wisdom falls on the older man, but uh, you you told me that that's not the case. Uh, the younger guys are no, no, holding no, much think, more intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Like right now, Carlson, I think he's only like 20, 24, and he's already been dominant for five years. So the second second guy is uh, Fabiano Caruana. He's like 23. And then the, the other guys also. In the, top, in the top 10, actually, you probably have only a couple of guys who are, uh, you know, over 30. You know, a lot of this, this very surprising. young guys. That's surprising. That's really shocking, yeah. actually. Yeah, it's, uh, the energy level is very important. Those games sometimes can last five, six hours, and the factors you're younger and a little bit fresher helps. Um, experience will benefit also. Sometimes you will make a little bit smarter decisions, perhaps, from your experience. But overall, the, in, the younger you are, more chances you have to be a top top player, number one, and perhaps even a world champion. Now, Armenians uh, also have, I think you played against him. Uh, uh, he resides out of New York, uh, doesn't he? Uh, he's a uh, 16-year-old or 13-year-old? Yes, he resides, he was born, uh, yeah, he he is actually from Boston, Boston. Sam Savian. Uh, Sam Savian, he's a 14-year-old, and he's... Uh, a big time prodigy, and uh, he actually played in a recent U.S. championship. Uh, he's very talented, so he was awarded a wild card, the one wild card from the organizers of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So the alarm is up. He he did not qualify by the rate uh, rating because its rating is not as high yet. It's it's getting better, getting higher. But so he got the wild card, and he actually had a very very good showing in this tournament, and uh, so he is the big star and. Uh, you know, big big prospects for him. If he continues work hard and uh, train, yeah, he could he could definitely be a top top player. And you took him on in a tournament. Well, I played him in the first round of the recent U.S. Championship, and yeah, we were paired. We were gonna play anyway because I was gonna play all the players, so I played him in the first round. And what did you see out of him? I mean, is he uh, like you said? Uh, Takes chances and uh... yeah, he is a little bit different player. The younger generation is only 14, so he's uh, he's very aggressive. And um, we had a very interesting battle. I tried to take the battle in areas where I'm, you know, a little bit stronger, like positional chess and stuff, end game. So I managed to do that, and uh, uh, you know, it was a relatively balanced game. But eventually, I managed to use some of my end game skills and experience to win the game. But uh, he did beat uh, some other very strong players, and he beat number eight in the world. So, That's so Sam, Sam is, yeah, he's um, the real deal. Vanujan, can you fill our listeners in on um, if they have a kid out there, if or if they want to just do it? Uh, how do they get involved in chess? What what what's it take to? Uh, let's say, uh, like uh, like our friend Garik has his son Dikran yes. uh, that he said uh, I'd like to get him involved in chess. So how do people turn out to get involved in this? Well, in St. Louis, I mean, let's start with St. Louis. In you know, St. Louis is very, uh, you know, it's basically the capital of chess. Uh, last year, it was actually uh, in Congress established that the, the capital of chess is St. Louis, and I mean, there is this fantastic scholastic. Uh, center and the central west end so if you have a young child and you live in that area you should definitely take them on a weekend to attend some of these Sunday classes and sometimes when I'm in the area 
I am teaching those classes for the club. So wow. cool. there are great opportunities uh, in St. Louis to do chess and uh, for kids, definitely the Scholastic Center, Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. You can just Google that and uh, uh, they're very nice people, very friendly and they have really good staff, teachers and they invite grandmasters to teach. So I spend some time there during the year, the other grandmasters also. So. Now, do you do this uh, locally, too, on the teaching side, on um, the private side? Si- yeah, I, I do private lessons. I teach a lot of people. At the moment, I'm in California, so I teach people in Los Angeles area. And uh, But uh, most of my students are actually online. I teach them through that's, Skype. Oh, that's very cool. And, uh, so, you know, all my students are basically, they're all over the country. I can, New York, uh, St. Louis, uh, Chicago. So uh, it's very easy to connect and uh, it's almost like the person is next to you because you know, we also have a chess site that we log in into. We have a chess board. Instantly, we can Varujan, see the moves. Varujan, if, mm-hmm. if, if you want to give the plug out to your website, if uh, our listeners out there yeah, in if L.A., you, if, if they anybody's wa- interested yeah. to find anybody, out more anywhere. about, uh, yeah, to find out more about my career or lessons. So it's very simple. It's um, you know just my last name, akobian.com. If you go to it will have information about uh, you know my upcoming tournaments, some of the summer chess camps I teach, and of course private lessons which I do throughout the whole year. And you don't really have to live in LA; you can be anywhere in the you know in US. Some students actually live in overseas even. So, thanks to the technology, we can connect and uh, do the training. Yeah, Beautiful. and and I'll actually have that. It'll be in the the description of the show. We'll have your website as well as on on all of our social media posts and on the website. And uh, so, any of the listeners who want to want to find that can find it. Something I wanted to ask you, if I could, I could, sure. I could ask you real. Please do. Following up on the, you know, the last thing you sort of hit. If if anyone out there, you know, has a you know a small child or you know, you know, it's really any age at all, is you know, is there anything that you would, you know, the in your experience that you've seen outside of the game that would help them in terms of you know, starting to uh, to build their logic skills and their strategic skills that as they begin to start to play chess, that would help them on the logic side. Yeah, um, well, chess, it's, a, it's actually a logic game. If you, you go, if you study the game, it's, uh, there are concepts, there are steps we need to do, and uh, it, 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 it will definitely benefit them, and it will help them perhaps to improve their schoolwork as well, because chess also teaches you discipline, because if you don't have a discipline, you're probably not going to be a good player, because there are certain things you have to follow in order to succeed in chess. You know that mumbo jumbo I said about 10 minutes ago, that's what I was getting at, too. Yeah, okay. Thanks, yeah, Chris, yeah, for no, helping no. me out on that one. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, What's your next big move here? What, what's uh, what do you got planned? Um, well, um, summer is usually I'll be teaching some of the summer chess camps, and this is a very very popular for the kids. The kids don't have school, and the parents like to take them to the chess club. So I'll be in St. Louis uh, teaching a summer chess camp at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center uh, of St. Louis in Central West End. And uh, I have my own camp in LA. I'll be teaching that as well, and. Um, I got two major tournaments coming up. One is um, the World Cup, which I qualified uh, from the U.S. Championship. The top five players qualify, so I qualified to that. And that's the very, very big tournament because that's a qualified tournament to the candidates tournament. And uh, basically the winner of the candidates tournament gets to play against the world champion. Now, Varuja, I got one more question here. I sure. watched I watched your YouTube video on on the moves. I I tried to understand something about chess. Let me ask you this: If you guys know exactly what they're going to be coming up with, you're already two three moves understanding what he's going to be doing. And now, you know what pitch is coming in baseball is what I'm saying. So. Aren't you getting prepared for what you, what you know? I mean, they basically stand with their same moves, don't they? They they, you know what I'm saying? It, it's yeah, weird, yeah, yeah. but I yeah. I seen you doing the moves, and you're already f- figuring out three four moves from this certain player. Now that translates to if you sit down with this player, he knows exactly what you're gonna do, and he know knows what you're going to do. Yes, well, what we do is when uh, this this big tournaments that I mentioned, when we play, we spend about three, four hours preparing against each opponent. 
We have databases, computers, strong engines. And what we try to do, we try to look at their previous games, and they probably look at my previous games, and we try to surprise each other in a sense that uh, chess, there's so many different variations and possibilities that you never have the same game going on for a very long time. Sometimes you can have the first 10, 15 moves do the same, but eventually, in some point, it's going to deviate. It could be even sometimes move 20. So we try to find some new ideas that will surprise our opponent and uh, try to get some uh, initiative that way. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's never going all the way to the end the same game. It's always going to be some different possibilities. I got you. I got you. All right, that's beautiful. It's amazing. Do you, do you ever play checker? Yeah, I can play a little bit. Yeah, I checkers. think I could take you on in checkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matter you know, of fact, checkers, they, they, there was an article on one of the major chess websites that a few years ago, I think they, they solved the computers, they solved the game because there are not as many different variations. Right. But chess, they haven't uh, done that yet uh, and because there's still uh, so many different moves and possibilities in each position. Well, next time you come to St. Louis, uh, <laughs> I've got to invite you over. We'll get the kebabs going. The, we got the <laughs> yeah. swimming pool, and I'll, I'll take you on in checkers. I know I'll get my butt kicked in chess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and I can honestly say for any of the listeners in the, you know, the St. Louis area or if you're in Chicago or if you're in L.A. and you're stopping through here, the, the Scholastic Center and uh, Chess Club that he mentioned, I've actually been in there. And it is a, a you know, really – Oh, it's awesome, beautiful. Awesome, world-class place. And uh, to get a hold of uh, Barujan, uh, go to akobian.com. Yeah. And that's his site, and uh, he can fill you in on uh, where he's teaching and all that. Yeah, and you can always email us here you know, at the show also, and uh, we would be happy to hook you up with him and send you his website or any other information that yeah. you need. Barujan, it's been great, my friend. My pleasure, John. Glad to be I, I on the will show. see you. I will see you, and uh, we'll hook it up. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Bye bye. Take care. Boom, boom, boom! What a great interview that was. I mean, Chris, I I don't even play chess. And I want to play chess now. Oh, it's like all that's going through my mind right now is going over to that Scholastic Center now in in St. Louis, or hooking up with him on Skype and and having to learn a little bit. There's no no kidding about that. I think this is this was a great. Uh, Great stuff. I mean, who who knows about this? Uh, we always hear about places to go, and it's right in our backyard in St. Louis. It's amazing, man. And uh, my friends, that was uh, Varujan Akobian, uh, Grandmaster Chess. And what a great show we had again. Excellent show. And if anyone wants to hear more of our shows, you can uh, find us on our website, armeniaproud.com. You can find us on social media. Uh, and you can find us on the iTunes store, Armenia Proud, Stitcher Radio, any uh, anything you'd like to ask the show, info at armeniaproud.com. And I'm so happy with all the responses we're getting here. We're getting a lot of emails. We're getting a lot of, a lot of feedback. Uh, I love you guys out there, and keep the numbers coming in. We, we've had a great response from you guys. From uh, from Chris and John here, uh, Genatsad Hayer. Kishet Party had a great time with you. We'll see you next time. Tune in next week for another episode of Genatsat Hayer. A toast to Armenia with Jano Kabinjian. You can find the show online at www.armeniaproud.com or download and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher for Android. This is the Ignotainment Media Network.